All right, we almost got, we're almost there, guys. So good. <laughs> I like that. Why didn't we start with that question in the beginning? I don't know, man. It's, uh, <laughs> we, 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 should, we should always play to the strengths of our guests rather than the strengths of us, Yeah, no, which is asking to, dumb questions. To, and maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should uh, start every podcast episode now with a, with a question. Hey, dear Mr. Guest, why will AI replace you? And why should I talk to you the next hour? <laughs> Welcome to the What's Your Baseline podcast. In this show, we talk about our experiences and lessons learned in enterprise architecture and business process management. What's Your Baseline is designed to be for everyone. Newbies who are just getting started with these topics, organizations who want to improve their EA and BPM groups and the value they get from it, as well as practitioners who want to get a different perspective and care about the discipline. Each episode will tackle different key topics, providing context, background, best practices, and stories from the road, inviting you to learn from our challenges and successes, and demonstrating key tools to help you set up your practice and get the most out of it. I'm your host, Roland Wold, and I'm joined today by my co-host, J.M. Erlinson. Hey, J.M., how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Roland. It has been one heck of a couple of weeks. Uh, I've spent a last little while on PTO making music, my other passion in life, and well, oh, it's very tiring because there's lots of creative juices flowing, but uh, it is rewarding. I'm glad I'm I'm making more music with people I love and uh, and making things that I I think will stand the test of artistic time. And I know you've had an eventful couple of weeks, my friend. How have you been? Yeah, I was waiting for the uh, backstage invite for your concerts, <laughs> or at least the YouTube uh, live stream, but that didn't work. When we um, get yeah, I I had a I had a blast. I guess, you know, I was in San Francisco this week, so I came back home yesterday. It was gridlock all over the, the city, you know, oh, yeah. a conference. Uh, the president was there with the Chinese president. Everything was blocked. So I had a blast. And then we spent the, the whole week in a windowless basement um, conference room, which was also an interesting experience. So, <laughs> so you were getting the creative juices flowing. You want people to be in a box with just fluorescent lights and that and say, okay, be smart. <laughs> so I, Ron, Ron can confirm the wonderful choice of wallpaper in that hotel. And, and it was very much. Shiny. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. Bag. Bohem yeah. was, I think the intent, but we will see. I don't want to diss it too much. So <laughs> it's always nice getting out of the house, but now I'm back home in my wonderful basement office and I'm looking forward to talking with you all guys. Uh, from basement to basement, I love it. Well, we have a really exciting episode today. I, I, mean, I got to tell you, these folks have been getting LinkedIn messages from me for the last little while, trying to go back and forth, back and forth about uh, <laughs> about all of this possibility, because today we have some amazing experts from the field of enablement. And I'd love to introduce these three. We'll, we'll start with the folks that I know, uh, Adam Egger and Peter Dern um, from Skilled and uh, they, they they run a, a fantastic podcast and, and video series themselves, and a, a bunch of uh, w webinars and and things called skill bits, which are fan really really fantastic opportunities to skill up yourself on some core stuff that that you could use for business, for personal growth, all the things that, that we want to find out how to improve on. So welcome here, Peter and Adam. Welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having welcome. us. <laughs> Happy to have you. And and Roland, you know Ron a little better than I do. Why don't you introduce him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so Ron and I work together. So I think we, we talk to each other three times a day, sometimes more. Um, so yeah, <laughs> he's a, he's the man behind our wonderful iGraphics University. Um, ah. Yeah, even though, even though other people do the hard work, but I will not tell. True. <laughs> wow. Well, the, the trick is to hire people that make you look good. So Roland has done a fantastic job at that, I can say. Ah, that, that's hmm. a, yeah, you're right. I, I think a, that is this good. This is a double twist now, Ron, you know? Do we have Rebecca making you look good or did I hire Absolutely. you to make me look good or both? All of the above. <laughs> I think everyone's making everyone else look good. And I think that's kind of the core of our conversation today as we focus on enablement. How do we as professionals help to make others strong in their role help to give them the core skills they need to perform their job duties? How do we equip them as human beings to be better at working with others? And how do we drive a practice around this that leads to sustainable growth in organization? But I guess before we get to this, we might want to have a little introduction round so that the audience knows who are our guests. You know, they heard the names. So maybe 
uh, I don't know, I pick arbitrarily one of you. Peter, why don't you just talk a little bit about you, what you've done in the past, what you're doing now, and maybe also a little sneak peek behind the scenes, you know, you as a person, you know, what's your bucket list items and hobbies <laughs> and all that type of stuff. Ah, that's interesting. Okay, let's try to keep it short. So my hobbies, I, I, I tried to play some music in the past as well. So you should see if there was not kind of roll up behind me, a guitar standing there and claiming always, play me, play me, but I didn't do this for quite a while, I have to, to <laughs> confess. <laughs> Apart from that, yeah, I have two cats, which keep annoying me every day. So when I'm, sometimes when I'm doing podcasts like this one, I have a cat in front of me, like <laughs> and going through the microphone is really annoying. But anyway, it's fun. Yeah, so a bit of my background. I've been working in the same company like you, in Software Chief, for quite a while. And I had the pleasure to run the Corbett University, which was like the enablement department for long times for technical skills, but also for leadership skills, soft skills, sort of that stuff. So I think I have a bit of a background to share some experience on how to set up training departments, how to do proper training in a way. This was internal. Before that, I was running uh, the training delivery in Germany for SAP. So we had kind of 50,000 participants every year in our classrooms, 12,000 training days to deliver stuff like this. Traditional IT training in a way, but I learned a lot uh, from that one as well. What uh, do customers expect and how can we serve their needs with some stuff which is really valuable for the money they pay? Yeah, and yeah, today I'm self-employed with Adam. We founded a company which is called Skilled, like like skilled, <laughs> so you should be skilled for doing things. And the, the interesting part, what we're doing here is we combine business skills with personal skills. So we learned quite a while that it just doing business alone, doing technical stuff alone will not be sufficient um, to really progress through your life in any kind of a career. You need to have both sides of the metal. And that's what we look into. Maybe Adam, over to you. Yeah, well, um, I'm the other part of, of the other 50% of skilled. Yeah, it's uh, just the two of us. And well, we both left the same company. We've been with the same company for, well, I was there for 20 years. Um, and after 20 years with this one company, I left um, just um, because I had the feeling something has to happen in my life because I'm very much into introspection. I'm, I, well, spent a lot of time meditating, um, silent retreats. I try to um, understand how to, how to lead a good life. So this is basically my, my passion to better understand me, my thoughts. A question for you, because uh, I saw on LinkedIn that you, were, you did a silent retreat. For somebody who's a con is that is that right? For somebody who's a content creator who talks for a living, <laughs> tell me about the experience of a silent retreat as such a a completely <laughs> different way of being. Yeah, well, it's um, it's moving from the one hundred percent of um, being in the input and output creation mode to, to a zero input and zero output, which is uh, very unusual for my life because I'm a knowledge junkie. I create content and I consume content constantly and being in silence for an entire week is super difficult, but it always brings some relevations to me, to my life. And I learn a lot about what's going on up up there and i understand a little bit better how to how to live a better life so this time it was a zen retreat japanese style retreat with a wooden stock slaps on my neck involved so it's it's a very interesting experience but the silence is not the most difficult part of it the silence is is probably the easiest part because you walk like 25,000 steps a day and you, you, um, you're deprived of any kind of input which uh, creates mental, well, complete exhaustion. So it's, it's a nice experience. It's a ex difficult experience, but no. The stick part which you mentioned is just the one where you, if you get a bit dizzy or like well, idling off, then they take a stick and hit it on the back of you like, bam! And you go like, oh! 
Wow, wow. So now, now you don't want to know what I have in my mind right now, you know. So Adam is in his monk-like status right now. And Peter has his cat on his lap and his Dr. Evil from Austin Powers, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's us. Oh. Yeah, that's us. That's, also, yeah. also, Adam. At some point in time, I, you know, I, I, have you, you know, about the Shikoku pilgrimage? Have you ever read, read into that? I, I think I've talked about this before on the podcast, but it's the eighty-eight temples of Shikoku that you can walk around about twelve hundred kilometers. Someday we, we got to walk it together, friend. That'd be fun. The, Fifty days of introspection. Oh send no, pictures. not in silence. Send, yeah. send, send, send pictures, JM. You know, I'm I'm happy to watch it from remote, having a cup of coffee and <laughs> and having a chat with Peter and Ron. But speaking of which, Ron, uh, talk a little bit about you. You know, I, I, obviously I know you, but uh, you know, uh, the others might be interested. <laughs> Well, the first thing I'll say is I, I love the fact that when asked this question, it was kind of prefaced with, tell us who you are, but who you really are. Um, a lot of times when I hear that question in, a, in an introductory training or coaching session, it's here's my name, rank, and serial number. And to really get to know the person behind that is, I think, what enables us to, to coach and train. So for me specifically, um, I'd say one of the things I'm most proud of is I am a grandfather of six. So I have six grandkids, um, four kids, and uh, that. That takes up most of my time when I'm not uh, chatting with Roland about how great the Bills are and, and how the Steelers are struggling. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe not this year. But um, I've been in L&D uh, in various ways, honestly, for my whole life. But um, specifically in business, I started out on a BPO about just over 20 years ago. Um, and that's where I really started to understand the ideas behind and the methodologies behind coaching and training and some of the differences there. Um, honestly, the organization I was with struggled a little bit with that. So I spent a lot of time setting up the coaching culture and um, it was about 60,000 people globally uh, that my team was responsible for getting enabled and coached. Um, so learned a lot, uh, a lot of mistakes along the way, but those are all learning opportunities, which is again, something I interject into my coaching and training sessions. So um, very passionate about it. Uh, I, I, uh, I think the thing that, I love the most about it is those light bulb moments that people get. That's what drives me is when you're coaching with somebody, you're having that two-way interaction and you can see the light bulb go off and you didn't give them the answer. You, you walked with them down the path so that they could get there on them on their own and then they own it. Um, and, and that's the thing that I think continues to draw me back to this type of work. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, which is also very interesting. And, and just as a background, so we're doing right now an internal process mining enablement initiative where we have a little bit of a role play, you know, for all of our consultants and, and pre-sales people. And it's really interesting to see how how people react, you know, and, and what people do, because they just think, oh, yeah, I need to check off the box, you know, oh, that's a mm -hmm. training must be done by Friday. And I just end it, you know, and then you have those silly people, Ron, myself and two others uh, asking you to do complete different things, you know, and then yeah. quote unquote grade you on things like client interaction and presentation skills and all those wonderful things. So yeah, it's, interesting. It's it's the struggle that most organizations have, whether they're established or not, is really building that coaching culture, which leads to the enablement and training. If people don't understand how to be coached or why they're being coached. Uh, and I do find one of the biggest issues is people don't know how to be coached. It's weird. Uh, when I go to an organization, a lot of times they'll ask me, hey, can you teach us to coach? Yep, I absolutely can, but it's not going to help you if people don't know how to be coached. What are the expectations? What am I getting out of this? Why are we doing this? Otherwise, as Roland pointed out, if, if they don't have that, it's that checkbox. Okay, I'll sit here, I'll listen, and then we're just going to go back to doing what I think is going to be successful versus participating in that coaching and having leadership that participates in that coaching to drive that culture. Yes, yes, but maybe we, we take back a step. So we all work slash have worked for process companies. Um, and th the first question that I have is, is obviously, um, why should you have an enablement program in a process organization? Right. And what do you see there? So Ron mentioned coaching, for example, uh, maybe Adam, if you could give it a first step, that would be great. Well, I might have a different approach to coaching and um, enabling people in 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 this topic in this area because um, I used to be the innovation person at at Software AG and I, I helped people to develop better user experiences and customer experiences employee experiences. It was all about 
creating delight for the customers, for people in front of me. And um, the most impactful area that I was in was especially for in the process area when I was helping the strategic uh, customers to better understand how to um, why processes are important how to um, how to distribute the idea of um, working with processes throughout the entire company and I'm very much into uh, I believe into um, in in the idea of understanding the extremes so if you understand mm. the people who love to work with uh, the process tool whatever it is and people who hate it you will immediately understand how to spread it in your company and this was basically my task to to talk to all these users extreme users to better understand them to really understand why they love it who is it who loves it and who is it who has abandoned it, who who has used it and stopped using it? And after talking to like 10, 20 of them in front of the entire team of the of both partners, the buyer and the seller, people immediately understand how to spread this topic throughout the organization. That makes a lot of sense. I, I love that. That's a very public conversation that you're having. It feels almost like it's a, a moment of vulnerability, but in being vulnerable, you reveal the the motivations of an organization, people in the organization, because what is an organization but a collection of human beings? Mm -hmm. And revealing collective motivation is one of the greatest unifiers. I love that. Peter, I want to I turn to you a little bit here because we've been using a lot of terms and we like to define terms, but I've heard coaching, I've heard enablement, I've heard training, I've heard, you know, there's lots of other ways of putting it. Talk to me about the terms you like to use and what they mean to you, what different meanings they have. Are, I, are they all the same? Are they synonymous? Or do you use them specifically for a, a, a type of interaction you see? Training, coaching, enablement, they sound to me a bit like the sender part of it. Hmm. You know, um, that's the activity somebody does for someone else. The important piece for me is not so much whether there is a coach coaching me, whether there is a, a trainer training me, whether there is an enab enabler enabling me. It's more on my end. That's the learning piece. So what do I learn? Um, there are different ways to learn. Adam, the example that you've just given is like people in the, in the companies, they can learn very well if they listen carefully to selected people that tell them in a certain way what they kind of thought wrongly in the past or what they should learn doing forward, going forward to improve the things they have, the processes, the products, whatever. And that's one thing to expose it to the way people see it. So I'm not there knowing it all. I'm not inside out driven. I learn and listen to others. And that's one of the tools that Adam has described. Coaching could be another one. So in a way, if you coach me, then you ask questions. Coaching approach means you assume that I have the answers in myself and you just need to help me like a midwife produce them. So you ask in a certain way questions and I hopefully produce them the answers. This would not work for me to learn Chinese because I have no vocabulary. It would be just random guessing. Then I need a teacher, somebody who tells me. And there's a different ways of um, making me learn. But the essence behind all of that is the willingness to learn. And that's what I very often miss. So you described like this the, the situation where you had people in, in the training. They had to role play. They were kind of sitting there doing the tick box exercise. Yeah, just been there, done that, done the training, or, or completed some questions after a training in an LMS. You know, all of these kind of things. They don't help because people don't learn. They just complete the task. Yeah, that is true. I think that, Ron, that, that is exactly the experience that we obviously make right now. You know, so when you look at our participants, some of them pick it up quickly, they're coachable, they're, they're doing what we think they should do, you know, and they learn something. So uh, we had uh, an internal meeting on Monday where, where one of our instructional designers uh, presented Bloom's taxonomy, so the different levels of learning. Uh, mm -hmm. to the team, which are obviously not exposed to this, right, except obviously Ron and, and his two ladies. Um, and it was really interesting, you know, because the, one of the guys, he really applied to it and said, oh, yeah, I did this. Oh, yeah. And then I analyzed it. Oh, and then I did this and this and this. So so you could really see how the light bulb uh, went on in, in him, right? Uh, and, and the others 
not so much. Well, it's, the, the the issue there, Owen, and we've talked about it, you'll find individuals who are they're really looking for coaching, training, um, any number of support mechanisms. But if the culture isn't in place, and, and I, I do believe that the first step in all of this is establishing the right culture so that people are open to learning and open to coaching and that leadership is open to delivering that and understanding that all of these things go in multiple directions. So culture building is one of the first things that, that in my experience, I've looked at. Mm, absolutely. And I wouldn't say it's, only the, it's not only the openness. The openness to it, it's also right. kind of understanding the relevancy. You know, when I yes. ask the managers in the companies very often, where do you position, where do you position the importance of training and learning or development, how you call it? They would put it pretty up, high up in the rank. So that's top notch. But if you then really look at the daily business, what people do, the selling, the meeting with others, mm -hmm. the, the development, the blah, 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 the writing PowerPoints for my boss and all the, the stuff. And then there is down the letter, there is something like vacation being sick or being dead. Training is just above vacation. <laughs> it's what yeah. you do when you have <laughs> and nothing else to do. And I've seen this in some of the cultures. There is different cultures, like the Indian cultures, maybe different than the American one, just to take two extremes where they say, okay, I, can, I can't afford to go to a training. I have to serve my customer. <laughs> Never heard that. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you mention that. Um, it, it's one of the concepts I have with conversation I have with leaders all the time, it's, you know, they want to sell more widgets, if you will. Um, but they don't want to, they can't often see the value in one of my favorite sayings, which is if you want to speed things up, slow things down. If I take some time away to skill you up, whether it's through coaching, enablement, whatever it might be, yes, in that moment, I might not make that dollar. But on the next day, I will double that. And if I continue to coach and support you on the day after that, I'll triple that. And that's kind of the process that we have to look for. But often leaders are under so much pressure to deliver a dollar. They can't see to take a step back and slow down so that I can get better at this tomorrow. And I'm not always chasing the dollar that way. So then how do you appeal to them? I mean, I, I know, I know Adam and, and Peter, I, I know you try to fight um, for leadership uh, support in the enablement programs you deliver, mm. how do you, let, let's get your thoughts on that. How do you achieve that when you have such a pressure culture on senior leadership to deliver numbers now, getting them to think even midterm feels like a bit of a stretch. There is maybe I'll start with this one. This is like, um, it's a difficult one. Sometimes if you have a burning platform, then you don't take uh, time to learn. You just uh, extinguish the fire first place. That's clear. But there is, um, I, I used an analogy in one of a, um, a leadership presentation to the board where I convinced to get to free up some money. It was like, um, I showed pictures of some people from, it was military, there was kind of a combat scene. There were people sitting in a plane and there were some rescue folks, just uh, three photos. And I asked them, look at these photos. What do they have in common? And... Um, or like guessing a bit around, and I said, they have in common, if they make a mistake, somebody dies. If a leader or a manager makes a mistake, you only lose money. And people would not say that's important. So we go like training on the job, learning things as you go along, that's nice. But it would be surgery at the open heart all of the time. Hmm. And wouldn't it be much wiser to be like the military, the army, where they are training constantly, or the flight captains in the plane, where they are using this the almost crashes or even crashes of planes in a flight simulator to train the people up front. And this was like ringing a bell. Oh, that's, that's, that's right. We should do more of that. And not only restricted to having people learn it the hard way at the work desk, on the work uh, place, burning money, frustrating customers, firing employees or stuff, or losing them because they, have, they mistreat them as they're not properly trained. And this was a bit like a convincing. Yeah, but I, I think there's a different thing, and I don't want to go too far astray. As some of you might know, I spent 11 years in the military and another 10 in the reserve. Um, there's a mission behind it. There's a purpose, yeah. right? And I think a lot of people in business don't have a purpose. Right, they're administrators. Oh, yeah, I'm the sales guy. I need to bring in X amount of money, or I'm the consultant. I have to go to the client and do my spiel, or whatever. I'm the developer. I'm here to write code. You know, there's a, there's no true mission behind it, which I think is different in in a military organization, as you have just described. You know, because yeah, it it rains nasty stuff on you, 
right? And and you need to literally survive that that situation. Well, it's it's how do you personalize? How do you, how do you help folks to own that? A lot of times, when I see companies struggle, is they will tell people their goals, which immediately makes my skin crawl when when they tell people their goals because you can't tell someone their goals. What you can do is you can share what your business objectives are. And then through coaching and enabling all these other things we're talking about, I can align your personal goals if I take the time to find out what those are to my business objectives. And if I mm-hmm. do that well enough and I have those conversations, eventually I can show you how those things are aligned and my business goals that I need you to achieve actually support your personal goals that you want to achieve. And now my business goals start to become your goals too. But that alignment takes some time. And that's where a lot of leadership struggles is I need this today. And it's not something that's deliverable today. It's something that you have to carve out the time for. Yeah, I I, 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 I get that very much. That it, it feels like a bit of a fight for enablement professionals or people who enable mm-hmm. enablement professionals and coach them to, to get them over that hump of leadership. Um, it, the other thing I, I wanted to talk about, and this is where I wanted to turn it to Adam, and because I, I know that the, that the two of you have been doing podcasts to focus on or, or, or videos or a serious focus focus on new technology and things like that um, that are that are driving some parts of people's lives but it feels like you've you've cut things up for a bit of a shorter more attention like struggling audience tell me about how you see a generational or at least a, a sort of continuum difference between people in different roles and at different at different stages of their career has enablement shifted for you and what is that what is that different demographic? need from different enablement techniques well i have i have learned while testing the idea of skills with some some senior managers globally that uh, the attention span is getting even shorter than we have expected so uh, well uh, we have positioned our training is very short three hour training sessions that will enable your entire team into well a different way of thinking and all these um, leaders, global leaders, were like, oh, come on, three hours. We don't have three hours. Um, it would be great, really great, if you just provided 30 minutes of, of yeah. training. And that's it. <laughs> and we were like, come <sighs> on. We already we have already shortened our, our offering from three days to three hours. And you're asking for 30 minutes, which is, uh, which is the perfect amount of of time that they are able to spend on enabling or on training. So we have learned that we wanted to be, to be the, the efficient guys who, who well, uh, deliver um, efficient training in just uh, three hours and they were asking for even less. So this is how the world is changing right now. And the 30 minutes, we, we actually deliver now 45 minutes of the skill bit sessions to people to to make them feel like we connect them with with people interesting people from all over the world and we still deliver some some content which which covers the two needs that people have they want to learn some new content but especially they want to well know some cool people all over the world and this is basically the idea we don't want to go even shorter to well to these one minute uh, webinars which is by the way um, last week there was in Orlando there was or two weeks ago there was this um, click funnel uh, huge uh, whatever conference and one of the most um, surprising thing is that people are asking more and more often asking for 60 seconds webinars this is the world that we are in <laughs> yeah, i don't know it's it's like ted lasso you know be a goldfish you know and right. and mm-hmm. it's 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 horrible it's horrible but you know all seriousness uh, if you as an organization uh, either with for your own organization or for customers uh, offer training the widest form of training i want, want to get into the different forms of that but you offer enablement things to them do you really think it's it's feasible to have one minute snippets two people mm-hmm. I, I don't think so you know it's a piece of the puzzle but it's not the answer exactly it, there's you, you got to get to know your people to understand what they're going to be most receptive to and what i try to focus on in those situations it's not finding out what's going well or what we can fix 
Um, cause I'm not a believer in looking for those things as much as looking for what's most impactful. So one of the ways to get efficient in the delivery is when I'm working with somebody, a group or an individual on coaching or enablement, what is the things that we can talk about that are going to have the biggest impact on what you're trying to accomplish? Mm. And that's what I'm looking for in every interaction. And that's what I want to discuss in every interaction. Plenty of times where you find out what's wrong and you talk about it, the change happens, but it doesn't impact the performance. And likewise for things that are going well. Those things that are impactful, though, will change performance. That's what we have to figure out. That's what we talk about. And that's somewhere, somehow how we can get to a more efficient way of delivering it. But it's still a combination of tactics. But there's there's uh, also a, a core knowledge that you have to convey. So, Peter, for example, you worked for SAP, as you said. You know, I heard this is one of the most easiest programs to learn for a user. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Absolutely. No, no irony here. <laughs> <laughs> now the thing is, and I think Ron is completely right because it, it depends. It depends on what is the objective and what is the topic you're talking about. You know, the example that Adam has given, like the retreat. If you go for five days to a silent retreat, you need the five days and the silent retreat to feel the feeling that comes after five days in a silent retreat. You will not be able to do this in one minute pause. Mm -hmm. But there are things which you just can Google apply for get done. Why should you go for lengthy sessions and listen to boring PowerPoints, people just kind of putting kind of unimportant stuff on you, which you have to filter out the gold nugget, which is really relevant. So what is your recommendation then? So, so, and I'm asking, honestly, you know, because Ron and I were, were, were thinking about, okay, what is our enablement offering for our customers, right, and partners, mm -hmm. and maybe internal people, right? Because there is, I think, a, a core that you just have to train people, right? You need to train them concepts, uh, mm. like what is BPMN or whatever. You need to train them governance. You know, mm. how do you run the show? Why do you need this and why do you need that? And you actually need to train them tools, right? And tools might be easy or complicated or self-explanatory or not, you know, but there's a certain time that you need to spend, you know, definitely more than a minute. So what would be your your recommendation for someone who shall set, or is tasked with setting up these type of things what what would be the mix what is your recommendation on on these things that's a that's a, a simple question and a very complicated answer required because it depends on the the task at hand it depends on where you come from what your skill level is what you're supposed to be doing like for instance if you should be programming a very deep down code very complicated stuff you should have learned programming but as a citizen developer you can also with modern tools create some stuff which people couldn't create years ago without uh, even being the most uh, developed uh, programmers ever seen on the planet so it depends really and that's that's an uh, It's of course, an answer which is not fulfilling um, or then helping you. So what I would <laughs> believe is, um, as you mentioned, there is some governance stuff and there is also some expectations of customers. You know, um, you cannot go in there and say you just only get one minute stuff and nothing else. They would not buy the product because they expect handbooks. They expect some sort of training. They expect a webinar which goes for an hour where people talk boring about slides. When I'm looking forward in the future, I would expect something else to happen, which is artificial intelligence. So mm -hmm. we look at ChatGPT and others, I believe that they will be your companion where you can ask questions and the thing is clever enough to understand, okay, this is just an answer I give to you, do it like this, or here you need more background, I give you a document, please read this. Or there is a video which you should watch because that's what you need at the moment. I'm pretty sure this will happen and maybe as a company, as a recommendation for you folks out there, think in this direction. Try to establish these kind of Co-pilots. Microsoft is doing a lot now on their own platform for you for the development part as well. Yeah. The way I see that, Peter, is I feel like the AI is going to be another tool that mentors, coaches, trainers can use. I have yet to see how AI, and maybe it will down the down the road, but there is a piece where you have to get to know your people. You have to know your audience, and that can't necessarily happen with AI. It, it can ask questions, but it's not going to give it that human interaction today anyways, um, that people need to really open up to coaching and feedback and understand how to apply it and realize this isn't a gotcha moment. We're looking for light bulb moments. And that really can only happen when I'm working with that audience. I'm working with that individual to understand who they are, where are they coming from, and where do I need to meet them in their learning journey? Absolutely. AI is at the moment only It's a one, di one uh, bi-directional thing. It's my tool I work with. Um, the, what we do here today, like a guided session that JM is, uh, and Roland are leading and asking us things, 
this is not cannot be moderated by such a thing. A moderator kind of moderating team aspects or corporate uh, co collective learning will not work with an AI at the moment. It's just what I meant, like an individual assistant for yourself in the self uh, self paced environment. Yeah, actually, I, uh, Peter, you brought up a really interesting point. Now, and I, I mean, I we're nearing the the end of the first half, but I I, I want to talk about it immediately because it's so interesting to me conceptually. Um, and, and I think we've all been sort of alluding to it, whether or not the future of enablement holds this more of an idea of perishable knowledge, as in you learn a piece of knowledge, you sort of, you intake that knowledge, you use it immediately, and then you eject it from your brain. And so all training is only usable for like sort of a package time. So let's say AI says, oh, it looks like you're about to use, uh, you know, a, a VLOOKUP in Excel. Here's how you do it. Once you've done that, forget how to do that. And the next time you have to do it, we'll teach it to you again. But your brain's already so full, we don't want you to have to retain any knowledge. We're just preparing perishable knowledge bits that we're going to serve up to you as you're doing job functions. Is, is that, is that a, a possible future of, of enablement, like micro training? Well, I do believe in micro learning. I'm, I'm a little concerned with the disposable idea of that, though, because I I struggle to see how that's going to be efficient if every time I need to do something, I need to be told how to do that versus how do I develop a coaching training enablement culture where I can consume that information, improve my skill set at using that, cataloging it so that mm -hmm. when I need it, it's it's there. I'm doing it in the at the same time as the action needs to happen versus... Now I've got to wait to be told and then I can apply it. And then next week I need to be wait to be told that same thing and then apply it. So I would be very interested to see the efficiency behind that. Um, so I'm not, not yet a believer in it. Interesting idea though. I think that's horrible to be quite honest. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I, I think you need, what you need is a, a core set of knowledge, you know, pure facts, right? Yeah. This is how things work. Right, so you need to get this. And then you need to learn the different contexts in which that knowledge is used so that you can apply it. And then um, yeah, sure. in, in the next step that you also can then transfer that knowledge to new situations. And, and I'm really curious how you do this in one minute snippets. I, I just can't I just <laughs> You can't can support that. it in one minute snippets through like quick stops and such, but you can't develop it that way. Eh? So after you did the, the 45 hour PowerPoint presentation? <laughs> Yeah. Adam, correct me. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you mentioned this, like this, uh, the, the pressure of the people force, forcing us to make the sessions shorter and shorter and shorter. But correct me if I'm wrong. Um, what I've realized is, like these micro things, they are very often just door openers. In the end, if somebody is really, really interested, they take the time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sometimes just waste of time to force people to sit and listen to stuff which they are not interested in, just uh, out of kind of cohort learning. Yeah, yeah. Just well, sense. it's it, it goes to learning styles too. I mean, there's people that can learn in a group, but the majority of people don't. Mm -hmm. And if you if we're not focusing on learning styles, all these ideas go out the window. We can apply them, but if we don't understand how people learn and, and consume those things. Maybe we're solving for 20% of the audience that we're looking at it at best, that group that just happened to fit into that one style. So we really, again, I don't mean to keep harping on it, but getting to know your people is what helps you understand how do I set this up so that they can consume it. Yeah, I like that. Well, we're going to take a brief break. <laughs> I know people's brains are burning at the other end of the line. Thank you for listening to this first section, friends. Um, we're going to leave you with a couple questions to think about yourselves um, as we take a, a pause and play a little bit of music for everyone. Think about the types of enablement or coaching or training that you've been through. What actually resonated with you in these programs, either in terms of their content, in terms of the style of presentation, in terms of the packaging and channels? And what didn't work for you? What didn't leave you feeling like you were capable, prepared, excited, or even knowing what you were even talking about after the training? We'll leave you for a moment to think about these and come back with our second section, all about the how.
And welcome back to the second segment of the show. Very interesting conversation. Um, definitely a lot of nuggets in there. You know, I don't believe in personally, I don't believe in those one minute, I teach you everything learnings, um, but they can be useful to a degree. Either way, uh, obviously I'm interested in, in seeing, hearing what you guys have seen in the past, how organizations have put up their learning programs, either for their own people, uh, for uh, partners, for customers, right? And um, what were uh, ways of conveying knowledge and other information, and I would love to hear what those other informations are as well, that you've seen in the past um, in your organizations? Maybe, Adam, maybe you give it a first step. Yeah, well, I um, I trained people in innovation, and this used to be my main task. And I conducted like a training session to five thousand people on design thinking, on all these innovative methods. And I've tried it all, and I tried to understand what works best. And the concept that, uh, from my perspective, works best is a combination of research, understanding what is the driver, why, why people don't want to learn, what is it that why managers want their teams to learn. So understanding the, the ideas behind the driver, why do you as manager want me to learn something, what is the perfect outcome, what is it how th how should the world be different in in a year if if this course works perfectly i want to understand these drivers and i want to understand the 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 perception of the team why they don't want to learn or why they want to learn so it's this research part plus a kind of um search for the most intrinsically motivated person in this team so mm. this is something that works best. Um, I, um, instead of training the entire team, I was looking for the most intrinsically motivated people in, in the topic of innovation. And whenever I found them, I put all the knowledge into their brains with the, the, with the idea, with the goal to send them back to their team and to, to do the work for me. And this works beautifully. So instead of training a team of not non-voluntary participating participants, um, I just focus on one single person. And I put so much knowledge into this one person and so much confidence that I believe in you and I trust you that you will change the world. And if you change your team, you will be visible to the entire organization in your country and they will see you and you will draw whatever it is in the end. And this leads to them wanting to be the driver of change in their area. So it's kind of research plus finding the most driven person in this part of the organization. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. I feel like when I, when I'm, I, I used to be a trainer uh, for software AG for a long time. And I found that, that it was always a losing battle when I was trying to give people specific skills upfront. Mm -hmm. I always felt like the best trainings that I ever delivered were with, was when I would front load excitement mm -hmm. and the information will follow. But if you inspire somebody to go train themselves, that you've already won. If you train them, it's a kind of a crapshoot whether or not you've actually been able to achieve your goals. Which is interesting because the underlying assumption, and, and Adam, hold me honest on that, is you have a direct interaction with people. That is not what I see. What I see is a ton more of e-learning, micro-learnings, mm. videos, w whatever it is and to, to different uh, degrees of formality. So you're losing that direct people contact. How do you deal with that? This is this is just a supporting the the e-learning is just a supporting thing. If you don't in, if you don't kindle this fire in them, they will never start with the e-learning. If they they must be really intrinsically motivated to start with the e-learning. <laughs> Yeah, you, you definitely, <laughs> and we keep talking about it, you've, you've got to know what motivates people. And 
you can, I've asked this question plenty of times in coaching sessions, training sessions. What, what motivates you? And everybody raises their hand and says money. And it's, it's not money. I can promise you it is not money. Money gets you some things that you might want. But what motivates you, it could be career for some people. It could be I, I want to buy a house. I want to save up for my kid's college education. I want to buy season tickets to my favorite sports team. Whatever, that's, that's what motivates them. So you got to figure that part out first. And the other concept in, that I find is and this happens when they're out on the floor. It definitely happens in training as well. I've seen where we do this tiered thing where there's higher performers and lower performers, and we tend to focus on the higher performers because we think that's where you can get your, your biggest bang. But mathematically, what I've seen is when we actually bring the lower performers up, overall that helps our, our performance. And the way that I do that is an idea of personal percentage of improvement. So typically in a training or in a sales organization, you're kind of competing against everybody else on the floor that's on your team. And it can reduce the communication between people because I'm kind of competing against you to get that that payout. But if I focus on personal percentage of improvement and I incentivize people for that, now I'm just competing against myself. Did I do better than myself yesterday? And when I look at the whole team, still got to incentivize the top performers. But if I look at who had the greatest percentage increase against their own performance, it takes all that stress off of I got to compete against people who I've never beaten before. I just have to do better than I did yesterday. And that's the culture moving forward. Yeah, but that would assume that organizations would have the attitude that they compare themselves to professional sports teams, right? <laughs> if you want to have an analogy in there to say, hey, I'm the best person uh, on this team on my position. You know, I have to beat my whatever. I need to be better than the number two and the number three here because I want to play, right? I don't see that in corporate right now. <clears throat> There's a reason to this, Adam. You explain kind of the innovation part where people would not be uh, would wait not would not be sufficient to just take an e-learning because I want to interact, I want to be inspired, I want to be talking to people, like in a leadership training where you have to give feedback to others and you want to go in a in a, an infight maybe with your your manager to protect your folks and stuff. Anything that you would want to practice in role plays, and there is the technical things where you would just want to learn how to configure a, a web server. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is, um, for all of those whatever the format, whatever kind of the um, the situation is seen is, everything that beats everything else is relevancy for the learner. If something mm. is relevant to me, the format doesn't really matter. If somebody tells me, this is a little, there is an instruction, if you do this, you become a millionaire tomorrow or you, sol you, you solve the cancer problem that you mm -hmm. have or whatever is relevant to you. This can be just a handwritten stuff on a piece of paper. It, there's no need to have a singing, dancing radio show, full clip, video, blah, blah, learning platform shit. No, it can be just information on a piece of paper. That's sufficient because I'm interested in the pure knowledge, the content. The, it's relevant for me. If it's not, I have to decorate a lot of things around and keep the people engaged and motivated and blah, blah, blah. With all these kind of, you know, game theory things, Octolis is like... Who is the achiever? Who is the the um, the the one who wants to be like a, in a sports in a competition? Who is the one who wants to explore and blah blah blah? And that's nice, but that's now pointing back all into your question. Um, for all the trainings we talk about or the enablement, there is a certain requirement. You don't do this just out of fun. The mm. question I always ask back to the people who create content is: What should be different after you've done the course compared to before? What is mm -hmm. different? Why do you do this? If there is no need, throw it away. And lots of the stuff that we show, honestly, you know, the videos and stuff is just because I can say it, because I know it. I think that's relevant, but it is not. And this also leads them back why people are looking so uh, desperately for the one minute things, because they want to raise all the shit, which is just burdening information, not needed. Mm -hmm. And that's for the content developers. Please make sure that you make stuff which is relevant and everything else follows. But that's very often not the case. I know there is a feature, I have to describe it, so I give a course. Yeah. Meh, meh. Should I? No, maybe not. Yeah, that, that's also interesting. And, and, and uh, Ron, I'm pretty sure you have some experience with that. You know, when you create content and you have your, your subject matter experts who have done stuff the same way for the last 25 years, you know, get them into the habit. And, and I literally had that in one organization where a guy said to me, oh, if I do this training for you, do I move myself out of my job now? You know, and and getting your content creators to a certain uh, level of thinking about this, that takes for, forever, 
right see my california teenage girl eye roll here you know <laughs> uh it's it's like yeah it's it's a big it's a big change and and ron i'm you know i know you it have is. some experience in that yeah it, it's difficult um especially with the when you have folks who you need to use for that that aren't L D specialists they're not content creators they're product specialists and they spent their whole career doing not sharing teaching training even when they're in a consulting situation uh, i found that the idea of that of that sharing is still somewhat limited when they're very technically oriented so how do we coach those folks to understand the value in sharing that knowledge and to your point roland helping them understand that while we do this we're expanding our audience that we can speak to we're not working you out of a role you know most of these roles are not things that ai or things can take over right now so how do we spread the wealth? And that comes from helping our content creators, our SMEs, understand what is behind the enablement. Why is it important? Mm -hmm. uh, when they can get the why, they can see there's differences from what they're doing in their consulting roles to what we're doing in an e-learning environment and how those build on each other. Peter, you had mentioned that, that, that e-learning is kind of a basic and then you kind of move up into the more personal interaction. And that's where the real value starts to come in and the real yeah. learning starts to happen. And, and, and on that, on the flip side of it there's also then especially when you work in a small organization like mm -hmm. ron and i do you know there's obviously always a lack of resources mm -hmm. right everybody is focused on one thing and one thing only and everything else is some distraction right so they try to get rid of that distraction so on the flip side when i look at at, at our learning team right we have educators in there they don't know our software. They don't know what an API is. They don't know whatever, all the technical mumbo jumbo, right? But the expectation is, oh, can the product guys just not give a demo and your learning folks just pick it up and create some nice educational material for it? All right, so that's, that's definitely, it's both ways. Right, get yeah. the change in the SMEs, but also how do we skill up the people who actually create the content, who put stuff in to articulate and whatever other fancy tools there are out there? Absolutely, and there's one thing which which is which is coming to mind when you say all of that is um, it's very very much very diff difficult for the experts to understand what non-experts don't know. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. they should know. Yeah. I've been. We had a regional implementation group at SAP who were firefighters, um, and we had them so at a certain point in time develop the training for the customers and partners for uh, implementing and administrating SAP systems, which was a nightmare because they were teaching stuff which you do in the SD exception, the firefighter example for really great, fantastic <laughs> cases which no, normally don't happen. That's why you need these folks. And they were trying to train administrators in a way for the superheroes, which is not needed. Yeah, Could come back to the point, um, we shouldn't ask how much time a learning object or a learning thing consumes. We should ask how much value it provides. And it requires a certain time that it needs to provide this value. The thing is, people don't know what is required very often. That's a difficult thing. That's also what we see from design thinking. It's so difficult to step into the shoes of your customer, of the learner, to understand what they really need and get the, all the rest of the shit out of the way. And then you can keep it short. Very interesting, Peter. But how do I uh, manifest value? So when I, when I think when I'm offering an enablement, you know, I say, okay, I give you a two-day instructor-led training. The objectives of this training is blah, blah, blah. You use our software, blah, 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 right? So mm -hmm. that is something that I can sell, right? Mm -hmm. People understand this uh, because the underlying assumption is, well, if I send somebody to that two-day training, they know, to, uh, they know which button to click, right? So I'm, I'm done. I check the box, move on. How do you bring in the value aspect that you just said? How do you define it? How yeah. do you uh, package it? How do you sell it? And how do you, maybe more importantly, how, uh, how do you convince people to buy into this different approach of measuring value than yeah. just the box of blah, blah, you learn how to click the right button? Again, a simple question, maybe... I try to give a simple answer to this one as well. This so sounds like this. There is no value of something. There is only value for someone. So this means whatever you think mm -hmm. is valuable as a content producer may be completely wrong. You have to ask the audience. You have to step into the shoes of those folks, and that's difficult. That's, that's easier said than done. 
but to see what is it that they really require. So the valuable piece is what they really need, what they didn't have and what brings them to the next level. And this is, of course, difficult because very many people are really different. But for a product, it's not so difficult because you know what's new, you know what's the killer feature, you know what makes the difference to the competition. Mm-hmm. And now the value can come looking at your folks from uh, for the pre-sales and for the others, the technical folks who are in the, in the sales situation with the customers. The value can come where you can beat the competition. They also train people. They also throw money at people get, getting to learn something. But the better trained you are for doing the real great stuff, the more likely is that you win against your competition. And then the, well, the money was well spent. That's for these folks, for the support folks. The, the things that come up all of the time where you see they all struggle always at the same time. They make the same mistakes over and over again. If I get this out of the way, then that's valuable. Again, this is a learning needs analysis in a certain way. This is not only looking or asking people. That's looking at behaviors. That's looking at mistakes that happen. Then you can come and see, okay, what is it that I put in a package and give to the people? The problem that I see in the technical world of training is it's content driven from the content owners. It's inside out. Mm. I think these are all the features. I have so many buttons to click, so I should describe them. No, that's documentation, but that's not training. And for a training person, you really need to look into the learner world. What are the mistakes they make? What are the behaviors they show wrongly? What is it they, the questions, the stupid questions they ask all of the time? So they would then see, okay, that's relevant for me. And that's also the feedback you need afterwards. Was it relevant? Not not, did you like it? Was it relevant? So Peter, one thing I I would push back a little bit on it, and and maybe just because we haven't gotten that part of the conversation, but I don't just, as I said earlier, I don't just focus on what are the incorrect questions they're asking or or what are the things Mm -hmm. that they're doing wrong. Um, I, I do see value in that for sure, but I see equal value in, what are they doing well? But the uh, the real value is in, yeah, yeah, is in the impactful thing. So I think yeah, organizations course. that leadership that doesn't do what we do looks at: Can you just fix this thing? Can you find out what they're doing wrong and fix it? And I tell them I could spend a lot of time finding out what people are doing wrong, and it may have absolutely no impact on the outcome. Mm. Yeah, Ron, you're completely right. Sorry, if, so just to, to say this: Yes, right. The behavior side. Strength and the strengths, that's one thing. On the knowledge side, it's very often the skill gap thing. I, I'm not a skill gap uh, f- uh, in favor of this one. I only train for skill gaps. But um, that's something, if you if you know how to configure a web server, you know it. And then you can get trained 50 times on this one, but you know it already. There is not much you can improve on it. Maybe there is some you know, some hacks and uh, other things, but that's not what I'm saying. So, um here is what I what I mean is really observe where, where is the uh, the relevancy and where is the value that comes out of what you do, and not so much what do I think needs to be trained. What do I like? I love this topic. I love this method. Fantastic! So everybody should know it. No, that's nonsense. <laughs> Just because I love it does not mean that everybody else should know it. Yeah. Well, back up. You you'd asked a little bit about like what are some measurements. One of the first things I typically go to is a. a, a metric that is near and dear to almost every leader that I talk to is why they bring folks like this in and it's negative attrition. So mm. we're losing people for all the wrong reasons. If we train and coach properly, we mentor properly, you can see positive attrition and you can see stability. So positive attrition is when folks move up within your organization or they move up and then you've developed a culture where you're supporting them while they're looking for a role that maybe your organization doesn't hold, but another one does. And I'm still willing to coach that person up. So Going through that process and helping leadership understand, I can absolutely impact attrition, negative attrition, if you allow me to coach, train, and mentor these folks appropriately. Then they start to listen because I've yet to run into an organization that's looking for folks like us to help, that one of the core problems they have is I can't keep my people. The turnover is too high. Yeah. That's when I start to get the conversation of, well, if you give me an hour, I can save you. If you give me minutes, I can maintain. And that's not what they want. Well, that's what I, I've said a couple of times in the in the past year or so, is that you you want to encourage and develop people so that they, they are promoted, but you also need to open space for them so they can have new and enhanced roles because mm-hmm. the thing you want is developing people so they're more capable. What you want those people to do is work for you in that more capable capacity rather than going to find somewhere else to put their newfound skills. To a degree, yes. I mean, I mean, obviously, that's the, the the best case scenario. But it's also a great outcome when you're developing somebody, and they've said to me, and I've seen organizations that failed this horribly. 
someone will come up and say, look, I've been here for a couple of years. I want to develop myself for this role. And then I'm going to go apply in this other company. And they get put in, in the dark room. All right, well, you're leaving us, so we're not going to develop you. And what happens? Their performance drops. It just mm-hmm. drops like a rock. They're, they're spending their time that you're paying them to look for another job. Yep. But if I align with them and say, hey, that's your goal. Let me attach that to my business objectives. And I can start to align that. Two things happen. To your point, they might skill up and, and get a, a, a higher level job, if you will. But if they leave, which is also okay, they're now a net promoter for my company out in the workspace. Yes. So when they're working with somebody who says, hey, I'm struggling, this place isn't for me. Hey, you know what? Ron's company does a great job of enabling people and they help me to get where I am. You should go talk to them. So I wouldn't ever pull back from coaching someone who's going to tell me that they're going to leave. Absolutely. I want them to have that choice of apply it here or be a net promoter out there. And there's the other there's the other nice thing like this cartoon where somebody says, but what if we train them and they leave? And the other one says, Yeah, well, if we don't, what if we don't and they we'll stay? Leave anyways. Um, <laughs> yeah, but also for the for the to the leavers I would say like this is this big community outside. They would be future customers as well. Yeah, you can't control that. People are gonna go where they're gonna go. It's it's are you partnering with them through that <laughs> so that they wanna stay or they wanna promote. Yeah, so so I want to I want to turn this over to Adam a little bit because Adam I I know that there's there's a, a structure that goes into this and there's collateral and there's tools and there's a lot of like the sort of the the practicality of standing up an enablement practice within an organization particularly we look at like the you know as we come from the, the world of process and architecture because all of us do um, what does it take to make a sustainable practice within a large technology organization that actually enables people to perform their job functions, but also to feel inspired to grow, to develop, and to ultimately be able to deliver on the promises that they've made. Well, I'm moving back to to what I've said before. It's all about uh, understanding the drivers, and it's it's also an answer to Roland's questions before when 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 you Roland asked about the value. Um, my answer to the value and the the practice would be uh, if you use tools like Value Proposition Canvas uh, by Strategizer. You know that value means understanding what is pain and what is gain. What are the pains, what are the gains, and what is the dream outcome that they see in front of themselves. If you understand these things, the selling part will be super easy. So it's always these two diamonds. In in design thinking, you have the problem space and the solution space. We can create the the best offering on earth if no one... If, if it doesn't solve their pain or, or if it doesn't give them any gains, it's useless. It's money wasted. Even if we think it's the best offering on earth, it doesn't give them any solution if it doesn't cover any of their pains. So the problem space is the most important thing. And whenever I sell my offerings, I always tell people the preparation call is the most important call, not the actual delivery (laughs) phase, but the preparation call. When I learn everything about their dream outcome, their pains, their gains, asking all these questions, tell me how do you envision the perfect world in a year? Tell Mm -hmm. me, describe what is not working well. Tell me what is frustrating you, what is frustrating your team? How, why do they struggle with BPMS tools? Why do they abandon these tools? Why do some people love these tools? Or wh- what is the, the dream outcome? If you ask all these questions, the delivery part will be super easy. So then how do you deliver? Like what 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 are the what does a team look like? What are what are some platform examples or, or generic platforms? that you would use to deliver the right kind of training? Because I, I know I know that the, the answer, uh, Peter's already given the answer of it depends, right? But what are some common strategies you've seen when standing up the specific practice for enablement that has led to better results? Besides, you know, obviously, the first question being, well, what, is, what, what is your outcome? What are the goals? What are, how, how, would you, how, would, how would this 
change things for you as an organization? So mastery, uh, so there are th these three levels of mastery, purpose, and autonomy. Uh, these are the three things that make people feel like they belong to this team. MPA, mastery, purpose, autonomy. And if you, if you focus on mastery, if you focus on mastery, purpose is something that you need to give the team, something like showing them the impact of what we do. But mastery, making them experience things, making them play as a group, making them fail and learn from failing, all these things where they have the feeling they move upwards, not on the corporate scale uh, ladder where they have a new title, but rather I have learned something where I am the expert on our team right now. And this was fantastic to play around with this tool and, and now I'm the most capable person on this team. So mastery, giving mastery to one person on the team which will be the driver, again, uh, thinking about this, this kind of I used to use the metaphor of, of a virus, so spreading the knowledge um, throughout the organization as a virus to one person after another. And these people will uh, distribute the virus. This metaphor doesn't work anymore after <laughs> the last three years, but I, it used to be my favorite metaphor. But giving the mastery to some people so that they feel, um, hey, I have grown so much in the last weeks. This is from me, the key driver. And I think that our audience is also thinking about, it. so what do you see, audience, as an enablement for your organization right now, what's important for you and what you see coming in the future? What what practices do you have in place today that you might get rid of? What new practices coming up do you think might be really relevant and valuable for your people? And how do you want to go down that road of the development of new enablement practices? We'll take a brief break and come back with our last goodbyes from our guests, conclusions for the episode, and a send off to the next one. And welcome back. And typically, in this last segment, I do a little summary, but to be quite honest, I'm overwhelmed, you know. <laughs> but obviously, the question in every listener's mind is now, obviously, how do I connect to those interesting individuals about the topic uh, of enablement? And maybe since Peter and Adam are two piece in one pot. Maybe we start with Ron. Ron, how can people find you and, sure. and where can you point them to, to learn more? Yeah, well, I'm uh, very active on LinkedIn. So that's always the place I, I instruct people to go through first. Um, love to read the articles and, and get the feedback. Uh, as far as where I ask people to go next is go to university.igraphics.com and see what we've been building. It, it's open to everybody. It's a free resource. We want folks to, to learn about our company and to learn about our product. Great place to do that. And Adam and Peter, tell us a little bit more about you and also Skilled. Right, yeah, okay. LinkedIn as well, like Ron said, you can find us there. And you can find us on, a, on our homepage, um, skilled.de, like Deutschland, like Germany. Mm -hmm. um, this is in English, the webpage nevertheless, but we have also a German market to serve. So mo most of our clients actually come from Germany. So we also speak German, as you can hear from our accents or whatever. There is German training needs. We will be there, but also we do it in, in, in English. Um, skilled.de, S-K-L-L-D, without an I, because the domain, domain was taken. And I think <laughs> people will remember it's, this it's one easier. Cooler, come on. Yeah, it's, it's fancier cooler. this way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's for the next generation. Kids don't like vowels. That's been proven by Tumblr. Yeah, we removed all vowels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's also German. We, we also, we love our consonants, you know, yeah. so yeah. it fits in the picture. For me, well, just just uh, search for Adam Egger on LinkedIn. There are four of us. I connected with every single Adam Egger globally. So I'm building a <laughs> community of Adam Eggers. Um, and well, I'm the one who, who well, you will find <laughs> the one who works on at, at Skilled. And we write books, Peter and I, we write books about, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, running 
virtual workshops and about sales or whatever human well w- way of selling things so um we will be active on linkedin everywhere so you will hear from us more often and we definitely will put uh, the link to your podcast in the show notes like all the linkedin addresses and all these types yeah of and this uh, again in german unfortunately we also had one um we just paused for the moment in english for ai tools maybe we should revive them as we see there's a lot of interest out there um the english one is on substack the other one you can find everywhere on the place like uh, spotify or so and this is 101 we're just renaming at the moment innovation hacks was the title but we are in the process of renaming it because we're going more than just innovation Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's been a lot of interest on this specific call in that. <laughs> so lots of encouragement. And of course, as Roland mentioned, all those links will be available on the show notes, of course, on whatsyourbaseline.com. And that's right. A huge thank you to all of our audience members for sticking with us from this really fascinating, fascinating episode. And a huge thank you to our guests, Ron, Adam, and Peter. You know, you've been a, a really, a really interesting group of minds thinking about this kind of topic of, of enablement and coaching and what the future looks like and what people need and how to connect with them. This is a, a, a big thing. I, I, I really appreciate that very much. So once again, you can find more information at whatsyourbaseline.com. You'll find all the links to what these folks have been talking about, their LinkedIn's, the pages that, that they referred to, um, and ultimately lots of resources that you can use to skill yourself up on skilling up people. But thank you again. And until the next one, friends, I've been J.M. Erlinson. I'm Ron Cohen. I'm Peter Dunn. I'm Adam Egger. And my name is Roland Volt. And we will see you in the next one. <laughs>